This is the true story of my extraordinary experiences in the Russian Far East and Moscow shortly after the end of the Cold War. In July of 1992, just seven months after the fall of the Soviet Union, I flew an airplane and six-person crew into the Russian Far East and down the length of the Kamchatka Peninsula to Petropavlovsk. Our feat was made possible only because of the remarkable cooperation of the new post-Soviet Russian government. At the time, I believed we were the first Americans to ever fly into this little-known and virtually inaccessible region of the globe. Some 27 years later, in the summer of 2019, I was astonished to learn that Charles Lindbergh and his wife Ann Murrow had flown to Kamchatka in 1931, an incredible achievement history had largely forgotten. In a terrific biography of Lindbergh by Winston Groom, their flying to Kamchatka merited only a passing observation. He noted that Ann Murrow had written a book in 1935 about their 1931 adventure called North to the Orient. As I researched the topic, I became increasingly amazed at Lindbergh's aeronautical daring. A fledgling Pan Am Airlines wanted to start air travel service to the Orient, as Asia was called at the time. Juan Tripp, the founder of Pan Am, asked Lindbergh to explore possible routes from the United States and report on their feasibility. Using a piece of string, Lindbergh drew a line on Tripp's large office globe from New York City to Tokyo and committed to fly the Great Circle Path some 7,000 nautical miles to Japan, nearly twice the distance from Long Island to La Bourget. Flying over the Arctic and Kamchatka was the most direct fuel-efficient route, even though it was and still is the most isolated, barren, and by far the most inhospitable route. Lindbergh intended to accomplish this feat using a custom-built Lockheed Sirius airplane, a single-engine, open-cockpit monoplane on floats. The Lindbergh spent a year positioning provisions and fuel along the planned route and preparing their airplane and themselves for the mission. Anne earned her private pilot license and learned Morse code so she could accompany Charles as the radio operator, collecting weather information and reporting on their position as she could. They departed on July 27, 1931, from Long Island, New York. They flew no more than several hundred feet above the ground. They navigated point to point by dead reckoning, using the primitive navigational charts and terrain information then available. They frequently found themselves in fog, clouds, and storms, navigating with little more than a basic altimeter and a magnetic compass. To his great credit, as one of the most exceptional airmen ever to have lived, Lindbergh and his wife eventually reached Tokyo on August 26, 1931. Sixty years later, in March 1992, I was invited by the Russian authorities to observe and opine on the potential for their post-Soviet space program activities taking place on the Kamchatka Peninsula. I agreed to go if I could fly there using my company airplane. To my astonishment, they agreed. I was anything but disappointed to learn I was not the first. Being the second to Lindbergh is an honor for which anyone should be grateful. And by being second, I learned something important I might have otherwise missed that the great attraction in common to adventure, aviation, and entrepreneurship is not to try to be the first to do something or even arriving at a particular destination. Instead, it's that exceptional achievement comes from having the courage to knowingly embrace uncertainty and push through to success. But from where does such courage come? As you'll read, I learned early in life that the cornerstone of courage is optimism. The second half of the book shares with you the extraordinary story of entrepreneurship and intrigue that ensued once we reached Petropavlovsk. Partnering with the governor of Kamchatka and several key leaders of the region, I led the formation of one of the first Russian-American joint ventures in Moscow the following winter. My entrepreneurial concept was audacious in the extreme. To create something akin to the Hudson Bay Company in the Russian Far East, the Hudson Bay Company, chartered in London in 1670, controlled the fur trade throughout much of North America for several centuries and had a prominent economic and political role in Canadian history. 
Over the last 50 years, I've had the good fortune to fly much of the world in many types of aircraft. I've accumulated more than 6,100 hours of flight time and 12 jet type ratings. But what I achieved in the experiences you'll read about in the first half of the book was the culmination of my lifelong calling for aviation adventure. No experience I've had compares with the sense of adventure, the challenges of uncertainty, and the tremendous sense of achievement that flying in that part of the world was for me in 1992. It is also humbling to realize how much higher was the uncertainty Lindbergh faced. Becoming aware of and acknowledging his achievement allowed me to create a context through which you could better appreciate the uncertainty I faced and overcame. These reflections have also left me feeling a unique connection to him. In the 60 years between our adventures, aviation had been transformed. World War II ushered in an era of vastly more capable aircraft, reliable instruments, and support infrastructure, even in Russia, although frankly, flying in Russia in 1992 felt like time travel back to the 1950s. In the 30 years since my adventure, aviation has yet again been transformed, primarily driven by satellite navigation, GPS, computer technology, and resulting advances impacting every aspect of aviation from avionics to materials to manufacturing capabilities. Tools like the iPad with no end of flight support applications have revolutionized flight operations. Continuous improvement in training, safety, reliability, tools, and technology is what aviation has always been about starting with the Wright brothers. I hope to share with you a story that encapsulates the spirit of flying adventure in a time when the technologies that are so common in cockpits today were the stuff of science fiction. I had to do everything the hard way by today's standards, but in all fairness, not remotely as hard as Lindbergh and so many other adventurers that came before me. I've also learned from my various entrepreneurial experiences that success is not a journey for the faint of heart. A better idea is only the first ingredient in an opaque process that must survive many, many challenges, obstacles, and detours on an uncertain path to success. It was very early days for the fledgling Russian Federation in 1992. In the Wild West that Russia was, and in many ways still is, no one could be sure what the rules were. 